it's great to be here. I try to move around the country and meet with different groups like you in different parts of the country and, and uh, say why I'm so involved and concerned. As Serena said, I have epilepsy. Uh, it started when I was uh, about 16 years old. I had an automobile accident, hit my head. And we think that's what caused it. We really don't know what causes epilepsy, as all of you know. And so we think that's what caused it. I had the accident and um, I didn't have any seizures for about a year. Uh, I was in the barn uh, milking cows. We had a dairy farm, I was milking cows. And the next thing I knew, I woke up, I was in bed. I'd fallen into a feed bin. Uh, and my brother carried me to the house. And um, we had a doctor that came out. And when I uh, came, came back, uh, the doctor was sitting on me and I'm from a little small town of 2,000 people in Central California, and that's sort of the way they practice medicine there. So I was, he was sitting on me because I had seized. Um, and I could hear them, my family and the doctor, uh, but I couldn't speak for a while. And they were talking about all kinds of different things. And uh, uh, so I then went to three other doctors after that. Um, my parents never really told me what the doctors said to them. and those days and still today that uh, a lot of doctors won't talk to the individual who has the seizures or whatever, uh, they talk to others. And that's something that really troubles me because I think as patients, uh, people should consult with us as to what's going on as opposed to just others. So anyway, uh, these other doctors uh, talked to my parents and, and these doctors were telling my parents that I had epilepsy and my family, uh, I'm 100% Portuguese, uh, Catholic, so forth. My parents really believe that if you have epilepsy, you're possessed yes. by the devil. Yes. And so I always say that my Republican friends know I'm possessed, but to have your family <laughs> feel you're possessed is a little bit different. Um, but they never told me that. Uh, so after three doctors, they gave up on the doctors. And then I went to witch doctors. Um, and that was an interesting experience. Uh, uh, you know, I'd go into these uh, rooms and everything was dark and candles were lit and they would pour oil on my head and oil on my chest and then speak in languages I didn't understand. And after the third witch doctor, um, I said, you know, they didn't get rid of the epilepsy, obviously. Uh, one doctor, I'll just tell you, had me put a egg under my arm and have it, I had to hold it there under my arm for an hour. Um, and if the egg turned black, they would, had taken the epilepsy away or whatever this was, but the egg didn't turn black. Um, so I'd said, finally, I'm not going to another witch doctor and I didn't, but that then separated me from my family because I was being uncooperative and so on. And that started a, um, a negative relationship. And that was uh, difficult because my family started to um, not have me do things in public. They wouldn't take me certain places because they didn't want to uh, have people know that I had epilepsy because um, in the, a lot of cultures, um, when you have a seizure that people feel that God is punishing the family, because of some major sin that was committed, not that you committed the, uh, the major sin, but somebody in the family did. And so this was God saying this family has a problem. Well, you know, that's a heck of a burden for a family to carry, right? And so I didn't know anything about this, um, but I realized that they were pushing me aside and, and so forth. We had uh, we, uh, a dairy farm, we showed cattle at, at fairs and so forth. And my mother would say, um, you know, I forgot to send in your application. Uh, you know, so I knew something was wrong, obviously. But I kept on having my seizures. Um, I then uh, went away to college uh, and uh, I kept on having seizures. I thought that it was sort of, in a way, a normal thing because I'd have the seizure and then I'd get up and, and do whatever I was doing. Um, and so it was um, something that quote-unquote, didn't bother me that much. Um, uh, so 
I then uh, graduated from college and uh, to, um, I decided I wanted to become a Catholic priest. Now that was to the shock of my girlfriend of five years. <laughs> and, uh, and my fraternity brothers knew better, but anyhow, that's what I wanted. And so I go and have my physical, and the doctor said, um, have you ever had any passing out spells or headaches or whatever? And I said, yeah, for the last six years. And uh, he said, has anybody ever told you that you have epilepsy? I said, I've never heard the word. And uh, so he said, you do. And the good news and bad news is this. The good news, 1964, uh, you can figure that out. I'm 75 right now. So 1964, um, Vietnam, mm -hmm. you're 4F. You don't have to serve in the military. Uh, bad news is that the Catholic Church in 400 AD <laughs> said if you have epilepsy or possessed by the devil, you can't be a priest. Oh my God. Um, so I, and there's a good ending to that. So remind me in a question <laughs> if I don't tell you what happened. But anyhow, you, you can't be a priest. So I was kicked out. Um, and that didn't bother me because that visit with the doctor, I found out I had epilepsy and there was medication to help me with my seizures. So I was positive instead of negative. Picked up the phone after that. I mean, I got in my car, went back to the fraternity house, picked up the phone and uh, no cell phones in those days, picked up the phone and <laughs> called my parents and said, um, I know what my problem is and I'm excited about it. I have epilepsy. The doctor, my mother immediately said, no son of ours has epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And that kept the separation moving. We didn't talk for several decades. Now, again, I was not, you know, they are who they are. Uh, so then I was student by president, so I had lots of job offers. So I decided I'll start going to these interviews, right? So I'd go there and I'd fill out the application and the word epilepsy was on every application. I checked the box and I never got an interview. So after several of these things happened, um, I then started to realize there was something going on and um, I didn't know the word stigma at the time, but that's what it is. And so um, I started drinking because I felt that everything I'd ever loved in my life, my parents, my church, everything that was important to me had all of a sudden turned against me. And so I was drinking every day and drunk by about two or three in the afternoon. And in Los Angeles, there's a, there's a park called Griffith Park. And I'd go there and I'd go at the, uh, the uh, top of the mountain. There are no mountains. But when you're drinking, there's lots of mountains. <laughs> and so I'd go to the top of the mountain or the hill and I'd be drunk and I'd be uh, feeling sorry for myself. Uh, because I'd succeeded in so many things that all of a sudden I didn't know where I was going. And um, so one day when I was going to do the dirty deed, um, I was, uh, all of a sudden something came over me. And I looked down and I saw a merry-go-round. I'd never seen it before. And I saw these little kids getting off and on the merry-go-round laughing and carrying on, and a voice came over me and said, you're going to be just like those little kids. You're never going to let anybody or anything stop you from believing in yourself. And, you know, I've never been depressed since. I drink, but I don't get drunk. Um, and I just believe that that was what it was all about. Um, a week later, I got an opportunity to live with uh, Bob Hope and his family. A lot of you don't know, you're too young for that, but he was a quite famous, uh, right? You were way too young. Yeah? Um, and he was um, a very famous TV comedian. And I lived with the family, became part of the family, ate meals with him, traveled with him, did everything else. And one day Mr. Hope said to me, he said, Tony, your problem is, is that you feel you have a ministry and you, only, you think it only can be practiced in a church. And you're wrong. Uh, true ministry is practiced in entertainment, in sports, in business, in government. And where you belong is in politics. And 
I had never thought of that, you know. But I took it in. And a week later, I wrote a letter to my congressman who I didn't know and said, basically, when I look at that letter now, I, look, I basically said, you lucky devil, here I am. You should hire me. <laughs> um, and I got the job. And I um, went to Washington. And it was, um, uh, he became my father. And his wife became my mother. And it was a great experience. I worked for him for 13 years. I'd have a seizure. Um, I've had seizures now for 60 years. I still have them. Uh, but they're substantially reduced because of the medication. And I'm on my, my sixth or seventh drug um, because your body gets adjusted and so forth. But um, I, I, I felt so good about this relationship with my boss. Um, when he decided to retire, he asked me to take his place and I got elected. During the campaign, my opponent said one day to a crowd, um, um, I don't know if you know it or not, but Tony's a sick man. Um, he, uh, he has epilepsy and what would you think if he was arguing something really important to us like water uh, at the White House and had a seizure? Well, uh, the reporter uh, next day called me and said, I understand that your opponent last night said blah, 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 blah. And he said, what's your reaction? And I'm not that clever, but something hit me. And I said, well, you know, in the last 13 years that I've been in Washington, I've known a lot of people who went to the White House and had fits. Um, <laughs> at least I'd have an excuse. Um, and that was the end of it. Nobody's ever used my epilepsy against me again. Um, then when I'm elected, I decided that it was an agriculture area in Central California. I decided that uh, the compact with my constituents was on agriculture issues, I'm with you 100%. On water issues, the biggest issue there, I'm with you 100%. But on social issues, I am who I am. And epilepsy, disabilities is my cause. And I had a love affair with my district. I got elected very easily and reelected very easily. But I started amending legislation, transportation, health, whatever. And I realized that, you know, none of that did any good because we didn't have our basic civil rights. And that's how ADA came about. Um, and if you look at it, it was, you know, a doctor uh, or uh, you go for a job, they can't ask you if you have epilepsy. ADA stops that. Uh, and so a lot of things that I went through is what I was concerned about for our basic civil rights. So it's, a, it's an amendment to the civil rights laws it's a, and so forth. It doesn't require you being hired or anything else like that because it's civil rights law. But you can't be discriminated against and you can sue. Um, it was the first step in regards to giving us rights. Uh, before July of, of 1990, you could be kicked out of a restaurant if you couldn't see. You could be kicked out of a movie theater because if you were in a chair, because you could be a fire entrance. On and on and on of all the things legally people could do. They could say you go in for a job and they'd see that you had a dis disability. They could kick you out and say because of your disability. None of that's legal nowadays. Um, so. Anyhow, we did the ADA, it passes. Um, and one of the things that happened is I call the Supremes, the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supremes decided that the ADA didn't cover epilepsy. Um, and that was a decision that they came to. And so all of the disabilities that weren't things you could see uh, were not included according to the Supreme Court. My reaction was, well, then you're saying I'm stupid because I wrote the damn thing and I'm the one who testified and so forth and so on. And you, I didn't include myself. Doesn't make any sense. But so we did the ADA Amendments Act and now we're totally covered. The reason I tell you all that is because of my experience with seizures, my experience, what I went through. Um, I talked about my parents. Um, we finally came together after many years, uh, but the depth of relationship wasn't there. Uh, very honestly, I, um, my mother was interviewed by a newspaper when I was um, in Congress and 
she said to the reporter, uh, my husband and I made a major mistake. Uh, it is true what Tony says, uh, but we didn't know how to approach him and say we were sorry. And so when that article came out, I met with him and we recovered our relationship. It was never, never deep, to be quite honest. Um, now, in regards to the church, I, I'm elected to the Congress. I become the majority whip, which is the third highest position in the Congress. And you get to make a trip and you can go to three different countries. So where do you want to go? Portuguese, let's go to Portugal, right? Because the highest ranking Portuguese, red carpet, all that stuff, wonderful. Morocco, the State Department wanted me to go to because the King of Morocco was working with the Portuguese government in regards to the Middle East. They needed me to help out and do something. Yep, that's fine. I get to pick the third place. Okay, where am I gonna go? I wanna to go to the Vatican. I wanna see the Pope. So that's arranged. So I take my delegation, we go to the Vatican, we sit there, the Pope comes in, uh, we all stand up, uh, he sits down, we sit down, I go to the podium. And my view in that regard is that when you have a podium, either if it's wood or whatever, when you have uh, the control of an audience, that you need to take advantage of that. And so I get there and I gave my very boring speech that was pre-approved by the Vatican and the US government and so forth. I give the darn thing. And then after it's over with, after I give this speech, I say, Your Holiness, I could not live with myself if I didn't say something personal. Well, his minions around the room <laughs> started speaking in whatever Italian I assume. <laughs> my delegation looks up at me like, what are you doing? And my wife, then I'm no longer married, but my wife then looked at me like, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, but I said, I could not live with myself. I said, as a young man, I decided I wanted to become a Catholic priest. And I was denied entry because in 400 AD, uh, canon law was established that said, if you're possessed by the devil, you have epilepsy, you can't be a priest. I think that's very unchristian of our church and I wish you'd look into it. I sat down. He then gave his very boring speech um, and didn't comment about my remarks. After we took all the pictures, you know, you're not allowed to have cameras with a Pope, but they have 15 cameras and they take pictures and they charge you $5 a photo. Um, and we bought a bunch of them. Um, and so after we do all that, he gets ready to leave. My wife and I walk him to the door. He's holding her hand. Gets to the door, he turns around, he blesses her, turns to me and does not bless me. And if you're Catholic and the Pope doesn't bless you, uh, you're going straight to hell. There's no, no doubt about it. And so he says to me, young man, I heard your comments. And turns around and walks off. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I did what I felt I had to do. And if he didn't like it, that's his problem, not mine. Um, then two years later, canon law has changed to permit uh, people with epilepsy, men, of course, with epilepsy, to become priests. <clears throat> I don't take credit for that. I know what I did. And I don't know what went into the decision to change it. So I know what I did. And the reason I bring that up to you is that I feel very strongly that when each of one of you or me have the podium, that you need to say the truth. You need to speak out and say the truth. One of the problems I have with um, epilepsy is that a lot of people say they have seizures and they don't say I have epilepsy. Um, and the reason that's powerful is because if you can't be comfortable with saying that you have epilepsy, how do you expect others to be comfortable with it? And if you refuse to talk about it, you are enhancing the stigma that exists. And we have to get rid of the stigma. It is what controls so much about our movement. And there's all these fights all the time in regards to this, and it's because we ourselves aren't comfortable with saying we have epilepsy. So, I basically am very tough about this with groups in saying that the way we get ahead 
is if we're honest. The way we get ahead is that we let people see that just because I have epilepsy, just because those of you in the room have epilepsy, doesn't mean we should be treated any different than anybody else. And if the stigma stays there, we won't be able to change that. So I you know, am aggressive about this. I plead with you about it. Um, just speak up and speak out if you uh, have epilepsy. You have a seizure, but that isn't who you are. And a lot of people have different types of seizures and don't have epilepsy. So it is important that we do that. Um, the the um, situation with my family, I told you about my girlfriend of five years, she married somebody else and was happy thereafter and so on and so forth. So I want to bring you up with all those things uh, that ended up positive. Um, I say all the time that I thank God for my epilepsy. And the reason I say that is that I became a better person as a result of that. Um, I know who I am. I know my limitations. As I said, I still have seizures. I wake up every morning not knowing if I'm going to have a seizure that day or where it's going to be and so forth. So I don't drive a lot. Uh, I drive to a store and so forth in my neighborhood. Joanna Abbott's with me and she's a great friend and she just drove me here because it took over an hour to get here. So I don't drive in those situations. So that's a limitation, but I accept it. Um, and I, can, I can't be a cop. I accept that. I can't be a fireman. I accept that. I can't fly an airplane. I, can, I accept that. But you know what? I've done a lot of things that other people can't do. And that to me is what's important is accepting who you are, what you can and cannot do, and not letting it be a negative. Because you are as beautiful as anybody else. And, and if you don't accept that, it's a problem. And so for those of us who have seizures, those of us who have epilepsy, it is so important that we believe in ourselves, that we think that we are as good as anybody else. And for those that are loved ones, I preach this a lot, don't love us so much that you handicap us. When I think back, my mother loved me so much that she didn't want me to get hurt, that she didn't want me to uh, be discriminated against and so forth. And that was out of pure love. I didn't know that. And she never shared that with me. But now I realize what she was going through. And so I plead with loved ones is, let me be, let me make mistakes like other people. And if you don't permit me to fail, how am I gonna succeed? And so it's important to, for you to believe in yourself, and it's important for your loved ones to permit you to do things that you want to do. And sure, we're going to get hurt. Other people do too. And so it is important that we believe in who you are. And I say all the time that you have to get to a point where you love yourself. And that is really important. Because when you get to that point, then you don't really care what other people believe or think. And it's so important for us to do that, feel that, and so on. So I go around the country talking about what I've been through only to try to make a point with some of you about what you should and should not do. Um, that's my story. And I have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. The Epilepsy Foundation, we have chapters, affiliates, whatever you want to call up all over the country. That's where you should go to help advocate and to educate. I mean, it is so important to educate. And those of us who have epilepsy are the ones who can best educate. That's right. And so our loved ones can do it, but it's really important for us to educate and to let people know what epilepsy is and what it's not. Uh, so many people, you know, first off, uh, <clears throat> when I have a seizure, somebody tries to shove something in my mouth. People still do that. Um, and that is absolutely the worst thing you can do, right? 
Uh, my wife one time put her fingers in my mouth and I bit the finger and she still has the scar from my finger. Because you freeze up, right? And the other thing is you're going to swallow your tongue. No, you're not. No, you're not. But, but people do believe that. People really do believe that. And so it's, it, the only way we're going to get rid of those myths is to talk about it. Is not be afraid to talk about it. Talk about it. You know, I don't care what people think about me because of my seizures. I just don't. You know, too bad. And it, when you get to that point, then you can educate in effect, you know, because you're, you are who you are. And in your case, uh, you'd be a great advocate. You'd be a great advocate. So, uh, and how do you advocate? Where do you advocate? Everywhere. Everywhere. Church, wherever, you know, friends. All your friends should know. But don't wear a neon light. <laughs> Blinking down the street, I have epilepsy. But, but, but your friends should know, because if you have a seizure and you're around them, they shouldn't be frightened. And, and so it's, it's, that, it's just common sense to a great extent, but so many people are afraid to let people know. And that's a mistake, because you're in effect enhancing the stigma. That's right. And I'm gonna let me, let me say something story. about the license. You don't have a right to kill somebody, but you have a right to kill yourself. But you don't have a right to kill somebody else. And that's why you shouldn't be driving if you have seizures. And so that's the thing to constantly remember. People say to me, well, I, I can drive and I know when I'm having a seizure. No, you don't. <laughs> and you don't have a right to kill somebody in that regard. So I'm. I'm strong about that. I tell my doctor but when I have a seizure and he tells me whether or not he has to report me in based on what's happened. Mm -hmm. And that's the relationship between you and your doctor that you need to have that relationship. Okay, who else? I'll go right there and then I'll come back. Yeah. Well, in the history, the history of epilepsy, some of you probably read it, in, in the old days and so forth, the Greeks would drill a hole in your head to release the evil spirits, right? So we've had this problem for years. It's not anything new. Um, so, uh, it's, so that's why I keep talking about the stigma. We've got to let people know uh, what it really is as opposed to what people say it is. You know, I was in Congress for a long time and then uh, Clinton appointed me to a lot of different things. Um, and I uh, was chair of the Gore campaign. And, um, uh, and I, set up for Hillary, I set up uh, a disability group. We had 250 people with disabilities all over the country uh, with different disabilities, different ages and so forth to come up with policy and we had nine task forces and we made recommendations as to what to do in regards to policy for people with disabilities. First time that's ever been done. And my thing there was to get that in every campaign. I wanted to get in every presidential campaign, Democrats, Republicans, but also governors and so forth. And at the Democratic Convention, if any of you saw it, uh, disability was mentioned a lot. Never been done before. Um, and that's my goal is to try to get uh, the stigma of disability uh, eliminated. And if people will speak about it from podiums and on TV and so forth, you sort of eliminate that. Um, and so, you know, people forget that women weren't allowed to vote. Women weren't allowed to own property and so forth. If you were a person of color, you weren't allowed to own property. You weren't allowed to vote. If you were gay, blah, blah, blah. And so a lot of these groups have made progress because they've been aggressive about who they are and demanding. So those of us in the disability community got to get out of the silos. We got to come together because we're all one big family. And if we come together, we're a huge community. And if we come together and work together, we can make a change. So that's what I do today. I'm very into that. I also am chairman of a group called PIPSI Partnership to Improve Patient Care. And what that's about is saying, I'm a patient. And I want to be at the table when decisions are made about me. I don't want others to do it and kick me out of the room and make decisions about me. So that's what I do. That's my political involvement today. And I. I'm aggressive about it, and I don't ever tend to retire, and so I'm going to keep doing that stuff. But 
partisan politics, you know, I vote partisan, but I'm not into doing that much. Well, I'll tell you a quick story. I'm, I'm at uh, a, a hotel and ra a restaurant uh, for a breakfast with one of the leaders in the Congress. And the two of us are there talking, and all of a sudden, I wake up. I've fallen back. And I wake up, and there's a crowd around me. And the person that I'm with uh, is saying, you know, give him room. I can hear that. Give him room. Give him room. And then all of a sudden, um, uh, the firemen come in with their their fireman hats and the, you know the hat, the axe, and all this stuff and paraphernalia and so forth. And then they're asking me questions, which I answer. And they say, "We have to take you in an ambulance. We have to take." You. I said, "No, you're not." And they said, "Well, we have to." I said, "Uh, uh, sorry, I have a right, and you're not going to take my right away from me." And they said, well, you have to sign a document. I said, I'll sign anything you want, but you're not taking me in. This was, you know, a, a crowd there in this room. And, I, and so I took the opportunity not only to educate them, but the people around as to what was going on. So it happens all the time. And these guys, you know, they're doing their job, but they don't know better. And so one of the things that the Epilepsy Foundation uh, tries to do is have programs have programs with the police environment and so forth to educate. It's really important that we do that. Let me go over here and then I am, I'm restricted to 15 more minutes. Uh, Ronald Reagan is President of the United States and his staff is insisting that I go to this function he's having. And I had a conflict. I said, well, uh, I can come, but it'd be late. So I said, that's fine. Be there when he speaks. And so I get there and he gets up to speak and He's, you know, he liked to tell jokes, and so he's telling a few jokes. And then he says, you know, one of my biggest mistakes that I've made was that as an actor, um, I was, uh, played the role of Grover Cleveland Alexander. And those of you might know, he's a very famous baseball player. I played the role of Grover Cleveland Alexander, and in the film, uh, I basically uh, show him um, uh, passing out and it's because he's an alcoholic. The facts are is that he was having epileptic seizures and the family wouldn't let me tell the truth. And what I should have done was to say, I won't play the role uh, unless I can tell the truth. And I'm there <laughs> in the back of the room and tears are coming down my eyes because I mean, he, he really was very sincere, positive about that and that's part of our problem. Here's, here's a guy that was, you know, governor, president of the United States, an actor, and so forth, and he admitted he made a mistake. Uh, another one is, is Catherine Graham, who owned the Washington Post, and she calls me and says, I want to have lunch with you one day, and so I did. And in the lunch, she said, my daughter has uh, seizures, um, and she said, but she won't acknowledge it, um, and she would rather have people think that she's an alcoholic uh, and so forth. So she said, would you meet with her? And I said, yes. So I met with Lally. And man, I couldn't make any breakthrough. I met her twice, twice. I didn't break through at all. And so she never would acknowledge her epilepsy. And people thought that she was on drugs or, or an alcoholic. Uh, she'd rather have that. So, you know, I, it's... It's fr frustrating for somebody like me that you can't break through on that because it's, it's a bad thing to live with if not accepting who you are. Okay, one more question. Do I have time? The yeah. most important thing is we've got to speak up. Yeah. Uh, it's that we've got to be able to talk about our epilepsy. We've got to be able to educate people about it so that those type of things don't happen. But if you're not willing to speak up, that's going to happen. And so I, that's why I'm so obnoxious about it. That's why I get out there and I aggressively push and educate and do whatever I can to get people to speak up and speak out because those things do happen. And the cops are a problem as well. And it's not because they want to hurt you. It's not because she wants to hurt you. It's because they don't know. And we have an obligation to educate. And that's our job. Uh, to educate. And if we're unwilling to educate, then we're going to have the problems. So.
Right? Yeah, I think the, the critical thing is with Obamacare, I call it Obamacare, is that a very significant thing is that before Obamacare, if you had a pre-existing condition, epilepsy, you couldn't get covered. With Obamacare, that is prohibited. So they have to insure you now with a pre-existing condition. That means cancer. That means a lot of different things. And, and you do away with Obamacare, then that goes away. Now, if you listen to the politicians, they'll say, we'll, we're going to cover pre-existing. Now, that's your pre-existing, remember, and they keep on going. But if you really talk to them about it, it isn't covered. And that's you know, something that you got to be concerned about. Now, the interesting thing is in the markup, I mean, in the free period right now to sign up for Obamacare, I don't know if you've been listening in the last couple of days, record numbers are signing up, even though it's supposed to be eliminated, right? But record numbers are signing up. That, the important thing of that, it sends a signal to the politicians, you better be careful. And so I don't, my gut is, politically, I don't see them able to get the votes to get rid of Obamacare. And, and that's really important. Now, does Obamacare need to be amended and adjusted? Yes. But that's what they should be doing instead of trying to get rid of it. Uh, so just be watching that because that's critical to our community uh, that Obamacare be there for that one thing. There's a lot of other things in it. But that one thing is critical for our community. And I don't see it going away, but I hope I'm right. Okay, anybody else? One last question, and I'm, we've got to wrap it up. Thank you. Anybody? Thank you very much. Appreciate it.